Hello, I'm Tom, co-host of the Geeks and Gaijins podcast. If you're listening to this, you are either my friend and co-host John, or you are a random internet stranger who stumbled across our YouTube channel by accident. If you fall into the latter category, do not panic. You are under no obligation to stay. Feel free to leave whenever you feel like it. In fact, it is highly recommended that you do. Today, I will be talking about one of my favourite genres of anime, Shonen Battle. And I'll be talking about one of my least favourite parts of Shonen Battle, how they write female characters. The majority of this video will be discussing Fire Force Season 1, Demon Slayer Season 1, and My Hero Academia Seasons 1 through 4. So if you haven't seen any of those shows yet, feel free to pause this video and go watch them without any preconceptions. This video will still be here when you're finished with them. We'll start this video with discussing the catalyst for its creation, Fire Force. I've already reviewed Fire Force twice on the podcast itself, once at the 12th episode mark and once at the 24th episode mark, so I won't be going through my opinions on it again, other than to reiterate, I did enjoy the show overall. And that Mayday is metal as hell and I love it! Fire Force is good in that it has an assortment of female characters, rather than just one or two tokens, but the character writing on each of those characters as individuals is so poor that that commendation doesn't really mean anything. Now obviously my perspective on what makes a well-written female character is a little skewed, and it might not align exactly with what female anime fans actually would like in their representation, but hear me out. The most obvious candidate for best female representative in Fire Force would be Maki, who has incredible combat skills, a high amount of paramatic power, and exceptional physical strength. However, outside of her combat ability, Maki's character writing doesn't really exceed the usual tropes of stereotypical female characters, given that her two main characteristics are that she's a hopeless romantic and that she's incredibly insecure about her physical appearance despite having the body of an Amazon goddess. Essentially, she could kick your ass, but she'd rather stand around looking cute instead you'll want to remember that, that becomes a recurring theme later on. The other major female character that Fire Force introduces early is Iris. Iris is distinct from Maki in that she does not assume the role of a fighter. Instead, she is a nun, whose function in the Fire Force is to provide spiritual guidance. Sometimes this can be to the members of the Fire Force themselves, but more often than not, it is both to the enemies that the Fire Force are extinguishing and the relatives of said infernals once all the violence is finished. Whilst not so dumbstruck by romance as Maki is, the show rarely neglects an opportunity to demean Iris' character either. Outside of her narrative function, the main purpose of Iris in Fire Force appears to be to provide the audience with both moments of moe cuteness and with sexual objectification. The scales are tipped even further by the fact that Iris, unlike Maki, is a non-combatant and therefore has even less opportunity to influence the plot of Fire Force. More on that later. One of the later additions to Fire Force's female cast that I had high hopes for initially was Lisa. Similar to Maki, Lisa is a powerful pyromancer, which makes her pretty useful in a fight. The writer also took the time to make her part of the general plot connecting her to multiple characters in the core conflict. The exact form in which these connections manifest, however, are a cause for concern. As a brainwashed child turned spy turned traitor, the core of Lisa's character lies in her decision to either follow the orders of her abusers or follow her romantic relationship with Vulcan and leave the white clad behind. The full extent of Lisa's story hasn't been finished by the end of season one of Fire Force, or at least as far as I can tell. I haven't read the manga. But what elements are present in Season 1 do raise some issues that I hope aren't continued into Season 2. By the end of Season 1 of Fire Force, Lisa has been taken away from the White Clad and is in the quote-unquote safe hands of the Fire Force. However, this hasn't come about by any decision on Lisa's part herself. Instead, Captain Obi and Vulcan defeated her in combat and stripped her of any physical agency that would grant her the ability to actually make a choice between the two sides. As such, her loyalty has yet to actually be expressed. I hope this is a recurring theme in Season 2, but the way that Fire Force has approached Lisa's character so far leaves me sceptical. The fact that the brainwashing has robbed Lisa of most of her mental agency, combined with the fact that she's often designed to be wearing quite skimpy outfits, especially that white-clad one, 
leads me to believe she's been positioned more as a trophy for the men of Fire Force to compete over rather than her own actual character. Whilst on the topic of female characters with questionably villainous intent, I would never describe Princess Hibana as a truly positive depiction of women in anime, but she still possesses an impressive amount of power for someone of her gender in this genre. Fire Force in fact has two female characters leading its fire divisions, which while still objectively imbalanced, is sadly refreshing for a show of this kind. The issues I have with Hibana loop back around to the problems I raised with Iris which is appropriate, considering how closely connected the two characters are. When Hibana is first introduced, she and Iris have an exchange which highlights the different perspectives the two characters have. This, combined with their joint backstory, seems to position the two characters as ideological rivals, even if Iris couldn't possibly physically compete with Hibana. No, not like that. Pervs. After this debate, the plot rapidly builds to a confrontation between our protagonists in the 8th and Hibana's 5th. Now, by all narrative sense, this would mean that the divide between Iris and Hibana is brought to the forefront of the plot. And this does happen in theory. Seeing her old friend as her responsibility, Iris decides to go to the 5th alone to try and talk down Hibana. Sadly, rather than move the plot forward in any meaningful way or expand upon its characters and philosophies, Fire Force instead just forces Hibana to strip Iris naked with fire, for reasons that I can only assume were tasteless fan service, and effectively make her damsel in distress. As such, Iris accomplishes nothing more than forcing her friends to come and raid the Fifth, which, I remind you, they were planning on doing anyway. After the raid is over and Shinra has won his rematch against Hibana, the show continues to waste both her and Iris' potential. Now, you'd think that after Shinra had eliminated the physical threat that Hibana had posed, she and Iris would be able to continue their intellectual debate, but on a level playing field this time. However, Hibana has apparently found Jesus since being punched a single time and therefore has decided that all her behaviour up until this point, which he was fully on board with moments ago, was actually kinda of bad. She blames this on having no one to turn to. Now, all the evidence the show has shown us so far tells us that Hibana is the one that abandoned Iris, and knowing how much of a lovely person Iris is, Hibana could probably have gone and seen Iris any time she felt she had no one to turn to, but that's not really what I'm getting at right now. What I am getting at is that you'd think that Iris would be the best person to resolve this issue for Hibana, considering she's the person she has known the longest and has the deepest personal connection to, you know, despite her recently hostile actions towards her. However, the show thinks that instead this is Shinra's perfect time to shine. You know, the guy who just punched her in the face. Shinra claims that he can be someone that Hibana can rely on, as he is going to be a hero that everyone can rely on. Now, I do not understand why Hibana would believe him in this situation. These two have only met twice, and both times Shinra has been actively trying to undermine Hibana's interests, and he had just punched her in the face. I don't know about you guys, but if someone were to punch me in the face and then call himself a hero for doing it, I probably wouldn't be on board. Now, not only is Hibana on board, but apparently she falls in love with Shinra because of this. What? Call me a cynic, but I think there's a fairly obvious reason for all these leaps in narrative logic, which is that the writer wanted Shinra to be popular regardless of whether he'd earned it or not. Now, this scene does tie into the defeat means friendship trope, which is fairly common in shonen anime. It's where a foe or rival or villain joins forces with the hero after being defeated, either because they respect the hero's power, or they feel honor bound to serve him, or that they just weren't all that evil in the first place, really. Even with it being a mainstay of the genre, however, this scene still feels like it's taking it a little far. The fact that Hibana worries about having no one to rely on sort of comes out of the blue, but it's not a completely unrealistic underlying insecurity of the character. What's weird is that it's Shinra who is responding to that fear. It doesn't feel like a natural progression of the story beats so far. 
Instead, it feels like it's been forced in to give Shinra another big romantic heroic moment that he doesn't really need. So at the end of the arc, Shinra seems to be the only character who's really gained anything from it. Hibana joins the good guys, which is nice, but she also seems to lose some of her strength and impact in the process. Falling in love with Shinra seems to have cooled her temperament a bit, but she also acts sort of submissive to him with how much she praises him, which is weird for a guy who physically assaulted her. No, I'm not dropping this, it's still really weird and uncomfortable. She still maintains her sort of dominatrix tone with the rest of the cast apart from Shinra and Iris, but that always struck me as a part of her design that was supposed to appeal to a part of the audience with particular tastes, rather than be a strength of her character. Now Iris, as I'm sure there's no reason to remind you, was just made a bystander in her own story. Hibana was the only character that Iris had any real depth of relationship with, and now that the confrontation between the two has been sort of resolved, I guess? There isn't really much more for Iris to do for the rest of Season 1, and she didn't really do all that much to begin with. This story decision to give a female character a close interpersonal connection with a villain and then waste it by making Shinra fight that villain for them repeats itself with Tamaki. Now, Tamaki is something of an infamous character already because Fire Force gives her an in-universe curse that forces her spontaneously into sexual situations against her will. It's gross and uncomfortable and I don't think there's a single use of it in the show that I thought was clever or funny. In her arc, Tamaki is manipulated by a guy she has a crush on in order to help him with a project that, unbeknownst to her, is incredibly evil in nature. Obviously, as soon as she realises what's going on, Tamaki immediately turns on the guy and tries to stop him through force. However, despite her third generation pyrokinetic powers, all pre-established laws of the universe and basic logic, Tamaki doesn't even get to fight him, he immediately overpowers her and starts beating her senseless. This forces her to call for help, and who would show up to save the day other than Shinra, of course? Now too beat up to actually do any fighting, Tamaki has to just watch as Shinra fights the bad guy for her. Whilst the fight is going on, however, the bad guy accidentally strips Tamaki half-naked with a fire attack, just like Iris was. Woo. Super glad these scenes were included in an incredibly tense fight against a child murderer. So the fight resolves with Tamaki having been able to do absolutely nothing to stop her criminal crush who she'd been unwittingly helping, instead relying almost entirely on her male colleagues to do the work for her. Not to worry though, Tamaki doesn't need closure for this scenario. She doesn't express any guilt or shame or remorse or any other emotion about the whole event. It doesn't inform her character at all going forward. In fact, the only consequence of her unintentional infanticide seems to be that it gets her away from the first for a short time and hanging out with the eighth more often. And I can't imagine why the writer of Fire Force wanted Tamaki to be hanging out with the eighth and therefore on screen more often. <sighs> Fire Force is a story that seems to understand the importance of compelling backstory and high stakes drama to keep its audience's attention. However, when it comes to the female characters, it seems completely unable to follow through on these aspects. Iris and Hibana might be the only survivors of a high casualty accident, and Tamaki might be the accidental accomplice of a horrifying crime connected to the ongoing project of a religious terrorist organisation, but none of that stuff sticks. Instead, the author seems more focused on rushing through these girls' stories so he can get to his desired end for them, which appears to be whatever he thinks is cute or sexy for them to do, or have done to them. For more evidence of this, look no further than the nether arc at the end of the show, in which the 8th Division is divided into pairs in a series of underground tunnels. Each of the male members of the 8th are split into pairs together, whilst Tamaki and Iris are a pair, and Maki is left on her own. Each of the stories revolving around the male pairs focus on their competence as combatants. Captain Obi and Vulcan prove that their physical training and inventions are more than a match for any third generation pyromancy, despite having her pyrokinetic powers of their own. Lieutenant Hanauer literally breaks out the big guns, and Arthur saves him by showing off the fruits of his latest training. 
Shinra also gets to mess around with his new technique before heading into the ultimate climax of the season, whilst Victor seems to be there to use his intellect in order to explain the mechanics of how Shinra and Sho are slowly breaking the rules of the universe. Maki does get to let loose as well with some impressive fight scenes, but these scenes are bookended with segments of comedy derived from her pre-established notions of her femininity. Tamaki and Iris' storyline seems to be the author's attempt to inject moments of humour into a fairly serious chain of events, which I wouldn't be so opposed to if it weren't for the fact that the jokes are usually at the character's expense and that they are the majority of the female cast. Once again, the author takes the opportunity to build up a scenario which seems like the perfect opportunity for a solid fight scene and strong character development. Tamaki's opponent is hyped up by having other villains discuss how likely it is that he'll be able to kill all of the other members of the 8th by himself. It's a fairly clunky and inefficient way of establishing a threat, but it gets the job done. Meanwhile, Tamaki is having a flashback to a scene we haven't seen before. She's having a conversation with Shinra in which he's acting uncharacteristically dickish towards her. This seems to be so that the audience understands that Tamaki has something to prove. It's a fairly artificial injection into the story, however, and funnily enough, wouldn't have been necessary if the author had just taken the time to develop Tamaki beyond the end of her last arc. As I said before, Tamaki should probably be expressing feelings of guilt and disappointment after being unable to defend either herself or the kids, but she should also have learned her lesson from that experience and taken the opportunity to develop herself as both a person and a fighter. This new opponent would then have provided Tamaki with the perfect opportunity not only to prove that she's capable of defending others, this time Iris and the rest of the 8th Division, but also to help redeem some of the guilt she's feeling over helping and being unable to stop a kid killer. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, hype villain, something to prove, pyromantic powers in abundance, stuff flying everywhere, both sides getting the upper hand over one another only to lose it the next second, tension rapidly rising, and then... Um, it all ends after another one of those stupid fan service gags. Yeah, disappointing. Once again, the author decides that to just discard something that might actually be worthwhile and interesting in favour of something kind of cheap and lazy. It's not just Tamaki that gets undermined by this writing, although losing her sexual autonomy for the upteenth time does certainly do an awful lot of damage. Every villain in this organisation that said that the guy who just lost to Tamaki's chest could have killed the entirety of the 8th kind of looks a bit like an idiot now, and that does an awful lot to lower the tension of the story overall. But hey, at least Iris gets stuck in for once. It seems weird to me that the person who comes closest to what I would consider to be respectful treatment of a female character in this show is Arrow. Whilst Arrow is no more or less powerful than any of the other members of the show's cast per se, she does manage to avoid having to perform the same quote-unquote desirable traits as the other women in Fire Force. Simply looking at how the women in this show are visually presented will go some way to explaining the difference. Arrow's design is conservative and practical, well-fitting without being skin-tight. There is as little exposed skin as necessary, so little in fact that even Arrow's face is covered most of the time. The most the show does to feminise her is in fact to show her face, seemingly just to confirm that yes is Grill, and there seems to be a practical purpose in doing so as it helps differentiate her design from Mirage's. Compare this to the other women's designs in Fire Force. Initially, Fire Force might seem to favour practicality over fan service in its uniform designs, what with the bulky overcoats worn in combat and the loose jumpsuits worn at base. But don't let these fool you. This show never turns down an opportunity to sexualise its female cast. When considering practicality, keep in mind that these are the primary combat designs for some of the female characters. Similarly, Iris is often drawn wearing a nun's habit that is both way tighter and way more revealing than what you would expect from a respectable member of the church, when she's allowed to wear clothes at all. Mackie's tank top and baggy trousers seem like the least fetishized design of the main cast. But then again, this shot exists, so don't go thinking that the show leaves her alone either. So why does Arrow manage to avoid receiving the same treatment? Well, first and foremost, She's a villain. She kills people. 
I'm going to assume that the author believed that people wouldn't take her seriously as a threat if she was also treated as an object for the audience's desires. Which makes sense because I don't take any of the main female cast seriously anymore. This isn't to say that you can't have a female character who is both desirable and dangerous. The femme fatale trope is pretty well known and not unpopular. I do imagine that taking this route with Arrow would have made her overlap too much with either Hibana or Lisa's characters though, so that's another reason I'm glad that they didn't do that with her. Hooray for diverse female character writing! That being said, there is something strange about Arrow. I mean, other than the fact that she kills people, and that the author suddenly ran out of horniness when writing her. As a character, Arrow is incredibly bland. She never conveys any real emotion, nor does she communicate any greater depth to herself beyond is one of the bad guys. She's more Terminator than Terrorist, as close to a blank slate as you can get away with in a story. There's nothing in her facial expressions, her body language, her interactions with her allies, nothing to suggest an actual human being lives underneath her stony face. And that isn't in itself irredeemable. This show has a sizeable cast to juggle, so lack of development on some characters is forgivable. And it's not unbelievable that a real human being would be this serious and reserved. However, as the one female character I could single out as non-sexualized, I was hoping for a little more from Arrow. It seems a little weird that the depth of the female characters in Fire Force is strongly correlated with their sex appeal. It helps present the interpretation that if a female character is to be prominent in the show's story, they have to be regularly sexualized, and that if they are a character that remains in control of their sexual autonomy, you know, like real women do, they will be pushed into the background. The alternative, as also seen in Fire Force, is that when a female character favours power over pandering, they will be framed as monsters for doing so. And in stories, monsters always have to be defeated by knights. I wanted to like Fire Force. I still kind of do, all things considered. But the contradiction between the female character's potential and their actual execution is just so jarring that it ended up being the main thing I remember about the show. Which is a real shame, because it's clearly an aesthetic choice that somehow seeped in and disrupted the narrative. But at the end of the day, if you're going to force feed me scenes of Tamaki being half naked for some stupid reason every episode, and if it's not her, some other member of the cast? then I can't get away from it. I'm not overanalyzing a pattern if I'm being bludgeoned over the head with it repeatedly. In the end, Fire Force's legacy for me isn't going to be a well choreographed fight scene, some amazing animation, or even a charming character. It's going to be that it has forced me to reassess how female characters are written in other shonen action shows I like as well. By now, anyone who has any sort of familiarity or interest in anime should have heard of Demon Slayer, the incendiary new action-adventure anime released last year. The show, following the adventures of a young boy on a quest to defeat demons and save his sister from her own demonic blood, has been met with massive popularity both in Japan and internationally. Now, the creator of the original manga for the show, Koyoharu Gotoge, is apparently not comfortable with being referred to as a woman, which foils my plan of using them as an example of how even female shonen writers can fall into the same pitfalls as their male counterparts. However, Gotoge is still an example of a diverse voice in the genre, and that, combined with the sheer popularity of Demon Slayer, highlights just how ingrained in the genre this imbalance in gender representation is. Demon Slayer is a fantastic show that focuses heavily on championing empathy and goes to great lengths to humanise even the most monstrous of creatures. It's not a show I would say that has any explicitly problematic messaging either. Certainly, the show features a number of intelligent and capable women who are never exploited for the sake of cheap fan service. In particular, Shinobu and Kano stand out as equivalent or even superior in demon slaying skills to their male counterparts. It's somewhat disappointing then to see so little of them during the show. Now, to a certain degree, this is in service of the plot and focusing on the primary cast members 
which I'm not against. I had a lot of fun watching the main trio of Tanjiro, Zenitsu and Inosuke interacting with each other. Out of the three, watching Tanjiro's growth and journey was by far the most compelling, and after some initial surprise at the show's time skip, I thought his story was very well paced. I find it hard to imagine inserting a fourth character into this group and coming away with the same story I enjoyed so much. Except, there was always a fourth character. This was always a quartet. Wherever Tanjiro goes, he carries his sister, Nezuko, with him. The very purpose of Tanjiro's quest, the reason for the training, demon slaying and befriending, is Nezuko. Without Nezuko, the story of Demon Slayer is completely different. So why does the character herself have such a small presence on the majority of the story? A thought-provoking article written by Trevor Richardson highlights how Demon Slayer's choice to not only keep Nezuko stored in a box for the majority of the story, but also to muzzle, hypnotise and infantilise her all lead to a frustrating and thematically inconsistent story. The article itself focuses on trauma and how Nezuko and Tanjiro share the same loss and pain, but only Tanjiro is granted the opportunity to express it, despite Nezuko having been both witness and victim of the atrocity that Tanjiro only discovered the aftermath of. The ultimate point both the article and I are trying to express is that throughout Demon Slayer's first season, the audience has very little opportunity to empathise with Nezuko herself, rather than just being invested in her safety through our connection to Tanjiro. Those familiar with Demon Slayer will already recognise the dissonance this has with the other demons Tanjiro encounters, who are not only fully verbal, expressive and characterised, but who are usually gifted with detailed flashbacks to encourage empathy from the viewer. This issue is hampered further by the fact that, on the few occasions we do get to see the world through Nezuko's perspective, we actually witness it through the lens of an illusion created for her by Uroko Daki's hypnosis, a feature of the story that, much like the muzzle, had not only already been proven on two separate accounts of Nezuko's actions to be unnecessary, but also prevents any of Nezuko's actions and decisions, and therefore any character growth, to be truly hers. Despite being the centre of the story and a main character, Nezuko's experience must always be conveyed to the viewer through the eyes of a man. Ultimately, Nezuko seems to suffer from the same strange monkey paw type deal that Arrow was cursed with in Fire Force. She's fortunate enough to be a competent combatant and doesn't have to worry about being exploited for sexual gratification, but she also loses any defining characterization at a price. She's also denied the opportunity to drive the plot herself. Instead, she is forced to stay sleeping in the box on her brother's back because of a nighttime rule that makes for some neat world building, but never has any actual effect on the plot besides keeping Nezuko in her box. Furthermore, Nezuko doesn't make her own decisions or express her own desires. She simply follows Tanjiro's lead, which is a completely unrealistic depiction of a sibling relationship, let me tell you. She's treated as little more than a semi-autonomous trophy. Man, this show is just full of the patriarchy. I wouldn't go so far as to say that Demon Slayer is as bad as Fire Force. As I've already hinted at, Demon Slayer is quite similar in how it empowers its female cast without being anywhere near as exploitative at the same time. The issue generally comes down to a matter of screen time and the roles given to the women, as they are usually either in supporting roles or acting as secondaries to a man. And with both the breathing techniques and demon blood being physics-defying magic, there's really no believable reason for such an imbalance of genders. Whatever might be considered the usual rules don't apply here. In fact, what few rules do exist in Demon Slayer's magic system seem to only exist to restrict Nezuko, as the other demons never seem to run up against any limitations other than Tanjiro's sword. These limitations appear to serve the purpose of attaching a tangible cost to Nezuko's decision to not eat humans. However, as discussed previously, this isn't really her decision. The existence of a cost would be much more important if Nezuko were fully autonomous, and constantly having to weigh the benefits of drinking blood against her own morality. That way, the temptation would always be there. Nezuko being unable to help Tanjiro because she had chosen to sleep would be a more personal complication. The test at the end of the first season would actually matter. But as it stands, none of this potential depth exists because we know that Nezuko is under the effects of mind control that won't allow her to do anything bad. Or anything at all, really. 
Now, in all fairness, as Demon Slayer went on and its cast expanded, it did get a little better at providing a larger number of female characters, and this trend very well might carry on as the story continues. Or it might not. I have no idea, I have not read the manga. Similarly, Fire Force is still a relatively young show with room to improve in its later seasons, and both these shows are fairly new to the anime landscape, so it's not all that accurate to use them to assess the current state of Shonen as a whole. Which leads me to consider a more popular show, one with a few more seasons under its belt, one that might better serve as a show that defines modern anime. My Hero Academia is great, I'm not going to dispute that, there's no way I could dispute that, and it has a truly wonderful female cast. MHA makes clear that gender is no obstacle to becoming a brilliant inventor, a powerful hero, or a traumatising parent. The show has featured some truly engaging character development for its girls as well. Achako's performance during Season 2's tournament arc is clearly the standout of all these, and a narrative beat that caught many people's attention for just how unexpected it was to see the primary love interest throw down with the main rival in a fight that, for a few moments, felt nail-bitingly close. Out of combat, Achako's romantic interest in Midoriya has also been handled pretty well. As deep and sincere as Achako's feelings might be for her AMC, her character has never been reduced down to merely those emotions. Instead, over the course of the show, we've seen her come to understand her feelings and put them to one side as she focuses on achieving her own dream. <laughs> I cannot express enough how wonderfully refreshing that is. I also cannot express how freaking sad it is that this is considered some of the best writing for a love interest in a shonen show. Oh wow, the person we're supposed to be invested in the protagonist living happily ever after with is actually a fully realised human being, with a life that actually exists independent of the plot. Yeah, what a concept. Moving on to the other girls in Class 1A. Momo is probably the next best developed female character. No, no, stop, I know what you're thinking, bad which is quite surprising for a character whose very outfit screams fan service. Her story has included her becoming a more decisive person and a better leader of her peers. Next is Tsu, who was given her own solo episode and was generally one of the more fun characters in the early seasons, before she started becoming part of the background. In season 4, Jiro and Mina have been given the opportunity to step into the spotlight, although the emphasis has been more on their hobbies than their heroism, and didn't really do much to develop on what we already knew about the characters. Legitimately, the flashbacks from Kirishima's arc did more to develop Mina and portray her as a hero. Oh, and uh, Toro's here too. So, what's my issue with this show then? What's my grudge? What's my beef? What's the tea? Is that right? Tea? Is that how you use it? Is that right? Tea? Is that what the youngins say? Right. Oh, I'm sure that will age well. To put it simply, when the going gets tough, the girls get gone. Sure, Hiraka lets the girls get stuck into their own fights and show off their abilities, but when the gloves are off and it's time to get serious, it's always the boys that are given the task of saving the day? Who ends up in the last stand during the villain's invasion of UA in Season 1? Midoriya, Bakugo, Kirishima, and Todoroki. Who fights Hero Killer Stain? Midoriya, Ida, and Todoroki. Who do they send after the villains who are kidnapping Bakugo and Tokoyami at the training camp? Midoriya, Todoroki, and Shoji. Why is it when something happens, it is always you three? Believe me, Professor, I've been asking myself the same question for six years. During the Bakugo rescue operation, Momo is brought along, but when the big moment comes to actually rescue Bakugo, she's the only one whose quirk isn't used. Like, seriously guys, she could probably have just made you a parachute. Like, they're real easy, she could probably just whip one out right away. Wait, how are you guys planning on landing anyway? What, an explosion? Really? Not a, not a parachute, an explosion, really. Wait... Okay? Right. Sure. And finally for now, we have Season 4 and the Shi-Hasakai Raid. This arc features a whole host of heroes, villains and fights. 
It also helps introduce UA's big three, Mirio, Tamaki and Nejure. Mirio is part of Sunaitai's agency, and they, along with Midoriya, are the focus of the arc and get the most powerful emotional beats of the story. Kirishima joins Tamaki at Fat Gum's agency, and the two students get an episode-spanning epic showdown with multiple top Yakuza members each. Meanwhile, Dragon Hero Yuku leads a squad made up of Nejure, Ochako and Su. Their fight lasts a few minutes and just sets up the stage for Midoriya's final throwdown with Overhaul. The anime only gives the girls the scraps of this arc story. Whilst Deku and Kirishima are in the thick of it and each get awesome moments and important character development, Ochako and Su are on the sidelines with nothing to work with. The story gives Tamaki a deep dive into his characterization and abilities. Mirio is at the centre of great tragedy and unyielding, visceral combat, even if his key fight is just a few coloured in manga panels. That's still better than how the show treats Nejure. All she gets is a boob job. Wait, what? A beauty pageant? A beauty pageant? Really? And that's supposed to make this all even, is it? That's supposed to balance things out. A beauty pageant. Really. <sighs> right, fine. Now, I'm not saying that there's some strange bias going on here where all the male characters get to be part of the actual plot whilst the female characters are given a side distraction to resolve out of an obligation to have them present to keep up appearances. What I am saying is that it's really fucking weird that Sir Night Eye's assistant... Bubble Girl, another key member of the Night Eye Agency and the only one of them that gets left behind, isn't allowed to go into the secret base with her boss, but for some reason we're taking fucking Rocklock with us. Who the fuck is Rocklock? Why is he here? He doesn't even do anything. Why are none of the women going into the secret base? Do the Yakuza have a No Girls Allowed sign hanging on their door or something? Why would the heroes even listen to that? It's not like Warren's agenda based. In short, My Hero Academia seems to understand the importance of writing its female characters with the same care and depth as its male characters. It just can't seem to commit to the idea of letting them share the same pedestal as their male counterparts. Whew. Well, somehow I managed to get through a whole section on how Hiroaka treats its female characters poorly without even mentioning Mineta. Oh god, he heard me! Run! Run! Now, some might say I'm just cherry picking here, and to those people, I would say, You're damn right I am! Have you seen how most action anime treats female characters? Believe me, I like these shows and I wanted to be more positive about them and a bunch of other shows I really enjoy. But then I thought about those shows some more and realised that they're all trash. <sighs> Suffice to say, action anime seems to have its own glass ceiling for its female characters. One that more and more characters are now finding themselves running up against as writers start to learn that they can write fleshed out women in their stories they just haven't yet figured out what to do with them. Some characters have managed to break through this barrier, but can only do so with some conditions attached to them so as not to disrupt the status quo too much. It's certainly true that anime is taking steps to be more inclusive and less discriminatory against members of a broader audience, and with that we're seeing a number of female characters in Shonen given better treatment than their predecessors. But whilst it is fun to celebrate this step in the medium's evolution, I think it's also important to ask, is this really the best it gets? Ha ha ha! I bamboozled you! That was a rhetorical question! I actually do have some positive things to say about anime. I know! What a nice surprise! So you've sat through me complaining about the pattern of female inferiority in anime for... probably way too long by now. And I realise that kind of negativity can kind of suck to listen to. Especially when I'm dragging an anime you probably quite like. So I think you deserve a reward. Here's a list of several anime whose writing for female characters is at least above average for action anime. Whilst not an actual show anymore, having been converted into a movie mid-production, Black Fox is still fun if you have a little more time to spare. In a world that combines ninjas, psychics and animal drones together, the story features two girls joining forces to defeat an abusive and manipulative patriarch. 
Black Fox does lean a little moe, which might not be your cup of tea and isn't always the most feminist of aesthetics per se, but I still recommend it if you're looking for a superhero popcorn flick. We're not exactly spoiled for choice on those. Weird aesthetic choices might put you off Planet With initially, but I can recommend it as a well-written story with a fairly even split of genders and female characters that look and act like real people, or at least more so than usual. If you like aliens, psychics, mecha, or just weird stuff in general, this is a show you should give a shot. Recreators is the rare action show where women are doing the majority of the work moving the plot forward whilst still being fairly balanced on gender representation. The plot revolves around fictional fictional characters appearing in modern day Japan in order to fight over the survival of all realities, meeting their creators along the way. It's certainly a lot of fun if you are a creator yourself, but it's just as much fun if you just have an interest in the creative process in general. Sword Art Online Gun Girl Online is, surprisingly, an SAO show that doesn't treat women like shit. Might be partly because there's no Kirito in this show, it just features an entirely new cast, including a female lead. Dive into the world of Gun Gale Online, a massive multiplayer online virtual reality shooter, and follow the main character as she grows both inside the game and outside of it. Newcomers to the franchise should be happy to know that it is a fun and accessible time even if you aren't very familiar with the main franchise. We can split hairs all day about whether these shows are actually anime. What's important is that they still feature some of the best female representation the medium has to offer at the moment. While some would argue that this is unsurprising considering they come from the US, which might be considered more socially progressive than Japan, let's not kid ourselves. This stuff is still fresh and new and further ahead than the mainstream, which is reluctantly catching up because they've only just realised that there's actually a market for female-led action. And with the lack of experience that comes from that reluctance, they're not exactly all that good at it just yet. But hey! At least they're trying, and at least these shows aren't afraid to let their women share or even steal the spotlight from the men. And some quick bonus mentions for shows that I don't think have a traditionally feminist message per se, but are still very interesting to look at in that regard. Black Lagoon is an action show that helps me to understand a little better what it must be like for women to always have to watch men do the cool stuff in action movies. It is a show that where almost every action set piece features a woman doing something incredible like a Terminator, whilst the guys stand on the sidelines being in supporting roles or are only present to immediately be murdered. It's fun, visceral and just amazing to watch. It just doesn't really exercise a message of true gender equality. In the other direction, Food Wars is not a shonen show that bucks the trend of massively sexualizing its female cast, it just also decides to massively sexualize its male cast, so it kind of all evens out. It's not a show that empowers or elevates anyone in particular, but at least everyone's playing on a level playing field. If you somehow managed to sit through the entirety of this video, or even if you just skipped to the very end, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, feel free to subscribe, like and hit the bell button for more stuff. If you would like to hear me rant about random anime stuff on a more regular basis, I have a podcast that comes out every Wednesday with a friend of mine who lives in Japan that should also be able to find on this channel. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye!